All right. Welcome you all back to another session, um, another virtual shouting session. I'm glad that y'all were able to join us this Thursday evening. Today, we're joined by Dr. Bonev. She's a breast surgical oncologist, a subspecialist. I know that y'all love to see subspecialists. It's, it's hard to come by, right? Um, but it, it's great to see a subspecialty. And she's also a graduate of UC Irvine School of Medicine. She'll be talking a little more about herself and the specialty, along with a few cases at the end. Uh, speaking of which, I do have a few reminders, um, including about the end of our sessions. At the very end of each session, we do have a Q&A. So if, if you're new to our sessions and if you have any questions for Dr. Bonav as we go through this presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat and we'll go through them at the end of the q and I'll be going through them in the order that we receive them. Um, like I said, though, feel free to type them in at any point in time. The second thing I want to say is for those who, again, are new and would like to stay tuned with more virtual shouting sessions, we have two ways that you can go about that. Either you can follow us on Instagram where we post our flyers, and that's likely how a lot of y'all have heard about us or heard about this session, particularly through this uh, through our flyers, um, either from an advisor or maybe our Instagram page. And then the second way you can do that is through our email listserv, which again includes our flyers. It's a weekly email. It includes the next sessions for the week, and we have sessions on Mondays and Thursdays. Actually, this week, we will have another session tomorrow on Tuesday. I'm going to be talking that, about that a little later, but typically it is Mondays and Thursdays. Um, so that's really all I wanted to uh, set out in terms of reminders. If you all have any questions, please feel free to email us and we're going to be happy to, to help out, whether that be a question about the virtual shouting program or our other programs, um, we're happy to answer any questions. But to not take up too much time, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Bonev to take it away. Thank you so much. All right, let's get started. So um, I'm going to be talking, uh, like you said, a little bit of my journey to medical school, general surgery residency, breast surgery fellowship, a uh, little bit about my practice, and then we're going to uh, talk about three real patient cases. So let's get excited. So um, I did go to undergrad in medical school at UC Irvine in California. I did complete my general surgery residency at Loma Linda, and then I did go to Chicago at Northwestern University Medical Center to complete my breast surgical oncology fellowship. So exactly what did I do in order to accomplish all that? So I know times have changed a little bit, but I'm just giving you an example what um, I had accomplished. Um, so I did make it uh, Phi Beta Kappa, Magnum Cum Laude. I graduated with honors. And that is um, uh, requires a lot of studying, as you can imagine. I did uh, complete research involving acupuncture and its role of neurotransmitters in lowering blood pressure. I uh, did present this um, in my program a poster and oral presentations, and then I did uh, publish it in our school journal as well. While I was in college, I did do a couple of volunteer activities. I was a, a volunteer peer tutor for uh, biology classes, which I really enjoyed. I did this for my uh, fellow college students. I also volunteered at Hoag Hospital, which is actually coincidentally, uh, one of the hospitals where I operate at now. And um, I was a volunteer where I rotated through um, different parts of the hospital, uh, helping patients and the staff and just learning more about medical care. Um, and then as I progressed in the program, I ended up getting a leadership role as a rotation coordinator. Uh, concurrently, I also volunteer at a free medical clinic um, that was nearby called Share Ourselves. And uh, I also volunteered not only in the medical clinic, but the social services clinic. So I got to um, see a lot about the underserved uh, population in Orange County. So uh, the MCAT is was really important when I applied. Uh, and I know scoring has definitely changed, but uh, I can imagine it's still very important. And there's uh, a few subjects that you need to uh, really uh, master, including uh, physics, organic chemistry, 
the verbal portion. So definitely a lot of studying and for the MCAT, studying for your classes in school, and then your extracurricular activities. So it's a lot to juggle. So time management is very important. So, um, you know, we were all so excited to get into medical school. And when I applied, I believe the um, admission rate was 47%. So let's say it's around 50%. And um, it's, it's definitely very competitive. But once you get into medical school, you realize, wow, there's a lot of information you need to learn. And um, uh, I know that uh, you had a radiologist uh, present uh, recently, and he also had a figure of essentially a person uh, drinking water from a fire hose. And they tell us that in medical school that you have to learn so much information and it seems so overwhelming. So what you need to uh, essentially do is brace yourself and figure out what's important. You know, some details you need to just kind of put aside what is the main focus. And um, as you progress through your training beyond medical school and then in uh, after your training, there's still a lot of information. So you need to figure out what's the big picture, what's really important, what do I really need to focus on? So what to expect in medical school? Um, in my program at UCI or UC Irvine, uh, the first two years were mainly dedicated to didactic lectures. So you're sitting in a lecture hall, uh, which I didn't mind. Um, then we had simulation uh, labs with uh, these almost like animatronic um, uh, uh, figures with uh, attending uh, doctors who was lead us through uh, med real medical scenarios. Uh, we also had anatomy lab with uh, cadavers. And then, uh, of course, in top of studying for medical school, we had to study for our step one and two exams, which were at the time when I took them uh, graded. And I think now they're pass, no pass. So um, some some things have changed. And then in the third and uh, fourth year of medical school, you get to go on to the fun part, which is your clinical rotations. For me, surgery was my first rotation, but you may get them um, just out of any order. But the main rotations that you will definitely be doing is surgery, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, ob -GYN, psychiatry, neurology, um, and then emergency medicine. Uh, you may have a radiology rotation, a research rotation, and then you have the option of electives. And there's, there's a lot of electives you can have. There's just so many specialties out there. And that also includes surgical subspecialties. And this is also the time when um, you have the option of going to another program, possibly in a different state, where you may be interested in attending and applying and see if you're a good fit for um, that program as well. So during um, medical school uh, wards, and residency, I felt like, at least at the beginning, a deer in the headlights. I mean, there's so much going on. You feel like you're out of place. You feel like you're also in the way. You're trying to learn, but you're also running after your team, trying to ask questions. It can feel just very um, daunting at times. But at the end of the day, you just have to realize your main job is to learn. And anytime you have questions or concerns, that's where you're coming from. You want to learn. So don't be shy to ask your um, attendings or residents or other medical students um, questions. So um, how to succeed in medical school? Well, it's pretty easy. Just know everything about the patient. Um, <laughs> uh, and what does that actually mean? It literally means know everything about the patient. So when you uh, start doing your clinical rotations, you're going to have a basic outline 
of um, taking the history. So the history of present illness, which is why is the patient there? What are their symptoms? How long have they been having it? And a mnemonic is old CARTS. Uh, you also want to know their past medical history, meaning their other medical problems. What medications are they on? Dosage? Why are they on it? Have they had any surgeries? Um, their family history? any blood work, imaging, and then their physical exam findings. So you really need to know the patient um, thoroughly. And it can be really helpful when you're with a resident and maybe they miss something important, like, oh, they're, they missed that their potassium was low. You can bring that up or you can bring up, oh, they actually did have a hernia surgery on the left side and it was with mesh. All of this stuff, even though it was in the past, is really important uh, when you're evaluating patients. What I would say as both an undergrad and as a medical student, you wanna seek mentorship. So when you're a medical student, three types of mentors would be a senior medical student because they've just gone through what you're about to go through and they can give you advice like how to study, what books to purchase, um, a resident or a fellow because they're going through training and you want to know, do you want to go through that type of training? Do you think you're a good fit? And then an attending um, and the attending can also provide letters of recommendations for you. Um, you want to keep reading both as an undergraduate and medical student, ask questions, like I said, because you're there to learn show your interest, be enthusiastic, and be proactive. When I was a medical student, I joined an interest group. So because I knew that I was interested in surgery, I joined the surgery interest group. And I also took a leadership role as the vice president and president. Um, I participated and hosted surgery networking events and suture skills labs for the other students. Um, I ended up um, working with some breast surgeons during my surgery rotation, and I thought it was really interesting. So I participated in research with them, and I ended up uh, presenting um, at uh, American College of Surgeons Conference, and then even uh, publishing in the American College of Surgeons uh, Journal. So once you hit residency, um, again, you're going through a lot of different uh, uh, rotations with the different specialties and then some programs, you may have the option of um, uh, rotating on uh, other specialties, but the main core rotations are going to be trauma surgery or acute care surgery, uh, bariatric and or minimally evasive surgery, pediatric surgery vascular, colorectal, surgical oncology, which does include breast surgery, um, gastroenterology, um, because you actually have to learn how to do endoscopy. So upper endoscopy and colonoscopy, and you actually have to get uh, uh, pass uh, simulated exams as part of uh, American Board of Surgery. Um, you're also gonna rotate on transplant surgery. You may have additional general surgery rotation burn, um, and you may or may not have cardiothoracic, ENT, or research rotation. And then again, there's additional uh, specialties like plastic surgery that you may have the option of uh, doing elective rotations, which I think is great if you have that opportunity. Um, you are definitely part of a team. And when you're a medical student, you are part of a team. You have to work together. It's not just one person taking care of the patient. As you can see this figure in the operating room, um, I can see the surgeon, the assistant, the surgical scrub technician, the anesthesiologist and the nurse. So it does take uh, a big uh, team to take care of a patient. Um, surgery is also a contact sport, not just in the operating room, but also outside the operating room. When you're, let's say, seeing patients in the emergency room, you have to place a Foley catheter, maybe an NG tube. You may get a uh, bilious vomit on you, which did happen to me, but that's uh, part, part of the game. So a typical day in residency. Now, depending on the rotation you're on, uh, it can vary, like transplant can be very unpredictable because you don't 
really know when you're going to have to um, uh, go and harvest an organ or go transplant it in a patient. But for the most part, uh, your days are going to include a pre-rounding, which is when you get sign out from the resident overnight. You're also going to talk to the nurse and evaluate the patient and see what happened overnight. Now, this is uh, this can start quite early. So I remember on vascular surgery, uh, pre-rounding could start. I, I remember the earliest was before 4 a.m. Um, but usually I would say around 5 or 6 a.m., probably around 5-ish uh, is a typical pre-rounding time. Then you're going to round with either your chief resident and or fellow and or attending. And these could be multiple separate rounds or just one round. And what rounding is, is that you're um, seeing the patients, evaluating them, going over their blood work, any imaging they have, do a physical exam and discuss a plan. After rounds, you're um, going to uh, correct their potassium if it's low, put in orders, discharge patients. At the same time, you're also going to have to go to the ER to see consultations. You may have to run over to clinic, see patients as well. Then you have to go to the operating room. You have to write notes for all the patients you saw. And then finally, when you get to the end of the day, you get to sign out. And sign out, um, when I rotated, was typically between 6 and 7 p.m. Um, however, if it was a really, really busy day, sometimes sign out could be even later in the night. And there is a hierarchy. So there's the medical student. The intern is going to be a junior resident uh, for general surgery. It was a five-year residency program. Um, once you become a fourth and fifth-year resident, you are called the chief resident. Um, so you're really navigating the rounds and you're working closely with the attending and you get to operate more. Um, and then you have the option, like I did, of pursuing a fellowship, which you do have to apply for. And depending on the fellowship, they can be very competitive to get into. And then once you've completed all your training, um, you are an attending physician. So these are some of the um, Things I mentioned on rotation, so on the upper left is going to be a colonoscopy, looking at diverticulosis and hemorrhoids, um, continuing to the right, a uh, burn patient with uh, uh, mesh grafting. When I say mesh, that's uh, skin. Um, you may have uh, breast surgery or plastic surgery. Um, down at the bottom right, an angiogram for uh, vascular surgery. So there is an interventional uh, radiology aspect um, uh, with vascular surgery. Uh, but as you can see um, on the left, there is a, essentially a dead toe, a gangrenous toe. So there is also that aspect of vascular surgery where you're doing amputations. I included a private jet because on uh, transplant surgery, you may have the opportunity where you have to fly to different parts of the state or other states to go do a surgery to harvest or remove an organ and then uh, transplant it in the recipient patient. Um, in the middle photograph, that is um, an emergency uh, thoracotomy. So that's in the chest and you can see uh, the hand is touching uh, the lung and then that's the heart. So that's someone, for example, who is maybe stabbed in the chest and you're, you're doing a last ditch effort to save their life. Um, all the way on the left is a tiny little intestines and a tiny little appendix and unfortunately necrotic or dead bowel. So that's going to be pediatric surgery. And they're going to have to re re uh, resect that dead bowel. And then um, in the bottom left corner is a CT scan with a dilated appendix. So you have to be able to uh, read your own imaging and talk with the radiologist too. Um, the type of surgeries that you're going to learn range from open surgery, which um, is fun because you get to see the organs, touch the organs. As you can see, the intestines are spilling out and that's a midline abdominal incision for an exploratory laparotomy. Um, you also have the opportunity to do or learn minimally invasive surgery, which you do have to be trained in and actually have to uh, pass uh, simulation training for the American Board of Surgery. 
And then um, you may be in a program where they have uh, robotic surgery. And that's where you have the surgeon not scrubbed in, they're sitting at the console um, operating, and then you do have an assistant at the uh, bedside. So there's a lot of variety and no one day is the same. So I did apply to breast surgery fellowship and I got accepted at Northwestern in Chicago. Um, I was not familiar with Chicago, uh, but I, grew to love the city and I got to do a lot of uh, fun activities when I wasn't uh, working in the hospital. So I really got to experience the city and that was a lot of fun. Um, fellowship is kind of more of the same as residency. Um, you definitely have more expectations. You do have more autonomy. Um, you work very closely with your attending and you get, you're expected to make decisions and, um, operate on the patients with, of course, supervision, but you have a, a very central role in uh, patient care. So some of my rotations, of course, surgery, and then we had a clinic with the surgeons, but we also got to learn from the radiologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, uh, pathologists, uh, physical therapy, and then I had a research rotation. And then, like I said, when I wasn't at the hospital and I was off on the weekend, I got to experience the city and it's uh, really beautiful. And um, I had a great time in Chicago. So um, here are some surgical resources um, that I used and um, I think they'd be beneficial for you. Um, so Student Doctor Network uh, is actually a online uh, essentially magazine or kind of newspaper for medical students written by medical students. And I actually uh, was one of the volunteer medical student writers and editor when, um, I'm sorry, for intraining.org. I was one of, the, um, uh, one of the early people who started it. So intraining.org has really uh, blown up, but Student Doctor Network is also another resource that um, I used. And um, it is, there's just so much information from what do you need to do to apply to medical school to um, what resources to study in medical school, how, um, questions about surgery rotations, residency, I mean, everything. Um, the Association of the American College of Surgeons, they have a careers in medicine site, which was also very helpful. And then if you are interested in surgery, there's uh, resources for medical students, residents and fellows at the American College of Surgeons site. Um, so those are all really great resources to look at. So um, now we're gonna talk a little bit um, about my practice. So even though I am a surgeon, I definitely have a clinic time and every surgeon has clinic time. Um, and I see patients with both benign and malignant breast disease. Um, I also see patients who are high risk for breast cancer. Um, I may do genetic testing on patients if I feel like they are a candidate for it. And I do see both males and females. Of course, I see mainly females, but I do see uh, males, um, for example, male breast cancer, which is rare, but I do treat that. Um, gyneco gynecomastia is also another um, common uh, reason for consultation from a male. I uh, perform some procedures in the office, but most of the procedures I do are in the operating room at the office. It may be a skin punch biopsy um, and sometimes a uh, needle biopsy. Um, a cis aspiration, that is a common procedure um, that I do. In the operating room, uh, the procedures I perform the most are gonna be an excisional biopsy, lumpectomy, which is also called a partial mastectomy, a sentinel lymph node biopsy, and then um, a mastectomy. And as you can see, there are a couple of different uh, mastectomies and it depends on uh, why are we doing the surgery, the patient's uh, uh, cancer, where is it located, how big, and uh, patient comorbidities as well. 
So we are gonna talk about uh, three uh, patient cases. So the first patient uh, that I encountered is a 62-year-old female Hispanic with a known BRCA1 pathogenic mutation. And she was referred to me by her medical oncologist to discuss a risk reduction mastectomy. So she was diagnosed the previous year with stage three ovarian cancer. And this was diagnosed when she was presenting with right lower quadrant abdominal pain. She had imaging and it uh, was diagnosed that she had ovarian cancer and she underwent a hysterectomy, which is removal of the uterus, as well as both her fallopian tubes and both her ovaries. And she underwent adjuvant chemotherapy. Because of her diagnosis, genetic testing was initiated and she was found to have the BRCA1 mutation, which does have an increased risk of breast cancer. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, she has high blood pressure and diabetes. She is obese. She did have a normal breast exam when I saw her. In terms of her family history, nothing that really points to a concern for ovarian cancer or breast cancer, but because of her uh, genetic testing results, her daughter was tested. She was found to be BRCA1 mutation positive. So that will definitely affect um, her daughter as well. So there are actually a few genes that are uh, associated with the increased uh, breast cancer risk. Now, everybody has all these genes that are listed, but if you have a mutation for the gene, now that can increase your risk of breast cancer. Now, the two genes that a lot of people have heard about and have uh, very high risk uh, for breast cancer are gonna be BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, this patient in particular had uh, BRCA1. Now, depending on the gene mutation, you can have uh, varying levels of increased uh, breast cancer risk, but uh, BRCA1 and 2, your risk of breast cancer can be well over 60%. And if you have a strong family history of breast and or ovarian cancer, um, your risk can be um, upwards of 80%. Um, now on the other spectrum, if we look at a uh, risk of 15 to 40%, that can be for um, a check two mutation, NF1, which is neurofibromatosis mutation, or one of the RAD51 uh, uh, genes. And uh, there are other mutations like CDH1, PALB2, P10, STK11. So on the right-hand side, you're gonna see a general population risks, and then uh, you can compare it to BRCA1 and BRCA2. So for both uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, the risk of breast cancer, like I said, is over 60%. There is a risk of male breast cancer in both, but it's higher for BRCA2. Uh, there is a risk of ovarian cancer, but higher for BRCA1. There's a risk of pancreatic cancer, uh, but higher for BRCA2. And then there's also risk of prostate cancer, uh, but higher for BRCA2. Now, of course, if a female patient, uh, like the one I'm presenting right now, uh, tests for a BRCA1 gene mutation, there is an increased risk of prostate cancer. Of course, not in her, but potentially in uh, family members. So that's why you want to get uh, her children tested once they're adult and she has uh, two adult children and uh, siblings as well, including male siblings, and because there is that risk of male breast cancer too. So for this patient, we discussed that because of her gene mutation, she is at high risk for breast cancer. So we discussed doing a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy uh, versus um, increased imaging and uh, examination uh, surveillance uh, with uh, chemo prevention medication. Um, she wanted to think about it and uh, initially do increased surveillance because she was essentially tired from her ovarian cancer treatment and wanted to take a few months uh, break, and that was fine. Um, and then we did eventually go to the operating room where I performed, uh, essentially I removed uh, both breasts but kept the uh, skin intact. 
and that is to lower her risk of breast cancer. She did want uh, implants placed, so I coordinated the surgery with a plastic surgeon, and uh, he placed what's called uh, temporary implants, which are tissue expanders, which, as you can imagine, they are expanded over time. And then uh, after a few months, those end up being exchanged um, for the option of silicone or saline implants, and she chose uh, silicone implants. So now, uh, because she's essentially at um, average risk uh, for breast cancer, I see her annually for a breast exam, and then she sees her other uh, oncologist for her ovarian cancer because of the risk of pancreatic cancer. She is uh, seeing gastroenterology uh, as well for increased screening. Um, her daughter already got genetic testing, but she does have an adult son who needs to get genetic testing and then she'll see her primary care doctor. So the second patient is a 35 year old female who was referred to me for a left breast cyst and associated discomfort with it. She does have a history of neurofibromatosis um, she, who she sees a neurologist for. She has a past history of idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura and a failed chromocytoma. She's had multiple surgeries, including a right adrenalectomy for her failed chromocytoma. Now, uh, this patient on exam has uh, neurofibromas, which as you can see in the photo are little nodules that are throughout her body and were also present on her breasts. Um, she said that she had never had genetic testing and because she has the um, neurofibromas, I wanted to um, confirm that she had neurofibromatosis and had a G mutation associated with that. So we did a blood draw for that in the clinic. In terms of her breast cyst, I performed an ultrasound uh, to confirm that she had a cyst, and then I aspirated it with a needle in the clinic, which provided her with immediate relief. As you can see, she does have a family history of breast ovarian cancer, and then a couple of other cancers. No other uh, family members ever had genetic testing. So we did a full uh, panel testing for 77 genes, and her results showed on, not surprisingly, a pathogenic mutation for NF1 or neurofibromatosis type 1. Um, she does have an increased risk of breast cancer. And as you remember a couple slides back, and I'll put a reminder slide in the next slide, um, that you do have an increased risk of breast cancer. And it is one of those genes, um, in addition to BRCA1 and 2. And then she does have an increased risk of uh, peripheral nourishy tumors. So she needs to follow up with her neuro neurologist as well as for uh, gangliomas. And then the risk of failed chromocytoma, which she already had and uh, had a surgery for that. So like I said, NF1 is uh, one of those uh, genes that does have an increased breast cancer risk. I often refer to National Comprehensive Cancer Network for guidelines on uh, management of uh, breast cancer. And if you look at those guidelines uh, for NF1, you can see that the breast cancer risk is around 20 to 40 percent. Uh, management is going to include a screening mammogram starting at 30 years old. And then uh, consider, in addition, uh, a breast MRI. Interestingly, the data does not support increased breast cancer risk after 50 years old. And um, evidence is insufficient for risk-reducing mastectomy, but you manage it, manage it based on a patient's family history. So once we got her genetic results back, that led to uh, her questioning her family members and digging deeper into her family history and discovering that, ah, there is uh, a lot of uh, family members with breast cancer as well as multiple other cancers. And, in light of these cancers and her results, we definitely want her family members to get tested. We discussed the implications of the diagnosis and because of her extensive family history and her genetic results, she decided to proceed with a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. In this case, we were able to save not only the skin but also the nipple and you can see the difference. Um, with a skin sparing mastectomy, which is uh, what my previous patient had, her nipple and areola were removed. Um, however, this patient got to keep it. 
She wanted reconstruction, so the surgery was performed with a plastic surgeon and implants were placed. Now that we've reduced her risk of breast cancer, I see her on an annual basis for a breast exam. Like I said, uh, we want her family members to get genetic testing. And uh, with some of the genetics company, um, like Ambry and I believe Myriad, um, patients who test positive for uh, pathogenic gene mutation, their family members can get testing for free within a certain time frame. And then we want her children to get tested, however, they are uh, school age, so we wanna wait until they're adults. And then she needs to definitely follow up with uh, a neuro neurofibromatosis specialist and then her primary care doctor. So the last case is a 70 year old lady who was referred to me after she had a mammogram that showed left breast calcifications that were suspicious and showed atypical ductal hyperplasia on biopsy, which I'll talk about in the next slide. She did not have any breast complaints. She was currently working as a flight attendant and has been doing so for over 40 years. She was taking hormone replacement therapy for 30 years. She did have uh, one surgery, which was uh, when uh, saline uh, breast implants were placed for augmentation in 1997. No family history of breast or ovarian cancer. On exam, she had the implants, but uh, otherwise benign breast exam. Now, atypical ductal hyperplasia is not uh, a breast cancer. It's not a malignant lesion. However, uh, we do recommend uh, typically when patients have this diagnosis on biopsy to undergo an excisional biopsy. So removing uh, the area uh, because uh, there is a risk of around 20% or maybe even a little bit higher of finding uh, malignant disease or cancerous disease. And that would be ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS, which is stage zero breast cancer and to a lesser extent invasive ductal carcinoma. So we wanna exclude these diagnoses by uh, removing the area. So uh, for this lady, um, I coordinated with a plastic surgeon uh, so that I would perform the excisional biopsy. And at the same time, the plastic surgeon would replace her implants with a new set of saline implants because her implants were over 20 years old. So there was time to uh, get them changed out. And uh, the type of implant, saline versus silicon, and then uh, the type within each, it's a conversation with the plastic surgeon. And the patient was very happy with her saline implants. They lasted for over 20 years. So she wanted to get uh, saline implants as opposed to silicon implants. So when I saw the patient at her post-op visit a week after surgery, she told me that uh, one of her cousins just passed away from breast cancer. And uh, so that, that was a new update in her family history. Now, what was also interesting on her surgical pathology, ductal carcinoma in situ, which is the stage zero breast cancer, was found. So she ended up having an upgrade and um, it was uh, close margins. What that simply means is that we have to go back to the operating room to remove additional uh, tissue. Um, in light of her family history and her new uh, diagnosis, we did a blood draw for genetic testing. I took her to the operating room and removed some additional breast tissue, but luckily there was no additional cancer or any other uh, disease that was found. She gave me another update in her uh, family history when I saw her for this second post-op visit and said that, Another cousin just died, was just diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Um, in light of her diagnosis, she was weaned off her hormone replacement therapy. And then um, she was referred to a radiation oncologist for uh, radiation therapy, uh, which she did complete. And then a medical oncologist for uh, tamoxifen, which is not a chemotherapy, which is a, a, a medication um, that is... Uh, uh, often given to cancer patients who express uh, an estrogen uh, and or progesterone receptor. Then I saw her back in the clinic because her genetic results came back and surprisingly they showed a pathogenic mutation in the MUTYH gene. So if you remember that slide 
with the different uh, genes mutations associated with breast cancer, this is not one of them. There is not an increased risk of breast cancer. However, there is an increased risk of uh, uh, colon cancer. And uh, she only inherited one copy. So it was a heterozygous mutation, which I circled um, on the bottom. So she did not have uh, extremely high risk, which if you inherit two copies, one from each parent, the risk can be 70 to 90%. So management is definitely gonna be very different. Uh, but for her, it's a discussion with uh, her gastroenterologist and to monitor her and a decision, does she need uh, more frequent colonoscopies? And so that's based on um, her family history as well. So I sent, sent her on her way to the gastroenterologist Meanwhile, genetic testing was recommended for her family members. I continue to see her for her uh, cancer follow-up. Um, she continues to get uh, care by the medical oncologist. She's completed radiation uh, therapy. And like I said, I sent her to her gastroenterologist and then she continues to see her primary care doctor. So some conclusions uh, from these cases. Um, about, or at least 10 to 20% of breast cancers are actually uh, hereditary. And that's why we uh, do genetic testing in a lot of uh, these patients, because we're looking for gene mutations associated uh, with cancer. And uh, someone does not have a diagnosis of uh, cancer, but we do genetic testing because we feel like they are high risk. And we found that they have a gene mutation that we can uh, essentially do increased uh, surveillance on them so that we can catch a potential cancer earlier. As you can see, genetic testing results can affect uh, management and screening of not only uh, breast cancer, but other cancers as well, and can affect uh, their family members and leading them to get testing. And should they have positive results, it could affect their health management as well. And um, testing as well as uh, cancer care requires multidisciplinary uh, management. As you can see, it's uh, oncologists, uh, gynecology, the primary care doctor, and then of course the surgeon. And then in some cases, plastic surgeon if uh, reconstruction is um, uh, requested by a patient. So this concludes my presentation and I am open to any questions you may have. Well, first of all, thank you for gathering this presentation together. It's really nice, like I said at the very start, to see a subspecialty. Um, not something that we see very often in general, right, with shadowing. So it's always great to get that exposure. First question that I wanted to ask is, what pushed you to become a volunteer teacher? And how do you think that made you a better physician overall? Um, for me, I just honestly really enjoyed teaching. I, I I, I was just really passionate about it. I, I thought it also helped me learn. It helped me come up with uh, different ways of um, uh, remembering the information. I got a lot of um, fulfillment from uh, teaching and I, I really enjoy it. And, and that's one of the reasons I'm doing this talk because I enjoy reaching out and you know, even if someone is watching this talk and they're not interested in surgery, but they can at least hopefully get some uh, tips from it and give some uh, perspective what medical school is like, medical training and all that. Earlier in your presentation, you discussed quite a bit about your um, undergraduate years, the activities particularly. Is there anything that you would say that you would have gone back and, and redone or possibly a missed opportunity that you saw that you would encourage students listening in to take that you didn't initially take? I think I really accomplished everything I wanted to do. And I think what I recommend for students is just try things out. Like I was actually in a couple of different, or at least one one other research lab. And, you know, it didn't, it just didn't work out. It just, I, it wasn't, interesting to me and it just didn't work out with the team and so I saw it another research lab and it ended up working out and I ended up presenting my research and learning it and it was um, it pertained to the medical field which I knew I wanted to go into so sometimes things may not work out and you just kind of feel it out or 
or, you know, ask um, some advice and it, it's okay. It's, it's trial and error. If you were to compare generally surgical subspecialties to general surgery as a, a specialty um, separately, would you say that there's any differences in the work schedule between those two domains? So I would say, yes. So if you're comparing general surgery to let's say breast surgery, for example. Um, so with a general surgeon, you, you can definitely do breast surgery. It is part of your training, but you're going to be doing a lot of other surgeries and you're going to be doing a lot of, um, gallbladder removals, which is cholecystectomy, um, colorectal surgeries, appendectomies, um, the call schedule, the work-like balance is definitely um, more intense uh, than breast surgery. Um, I feel longer hours. Um, now, if you were to compare general surgery to transplant surgery, general surgery may be a walk in the park because transplant surgery, like they say, feast, feast or famine. I mean, it can be extremely intense. And I can give an example where maybe during the day there wasn't much going on. We were able to do our rounds. We took care of all our patients on the ward. And then that's when your pager goes off around maybe 10 PM. And that's when you're off going, uh, being driven to uh, some hospital you've never been to harvest an organ and then going back to the, hosp the hospital where you work at and transplanting the organ. And next thing you know, it's uh, 2 PM and you're wondering when, when do you get to go home? <laughs> Yeah, it is definitely rough in, in surgery in general, but I appreciate that distinction there. The next question is um, regarding fibroadenomas. So would you say getting something like that would make it more likely to get, would make a patient more likely to get cancer? Would, would it be a disposition or a risk? So that's a good question. So if I see a patient with a fibroadenoma, um, there's a couple of things you wanna do. You wanna do a physical exam, you want to get imaging, which is often an ultrasound, confirm that it really does look like a fibroadenoma. And then you want to get a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Now, if the patient has a small fibro fibro fibroadenoma, like around, let's say, a centimeter, less than two centimeters, and it's not bothering them, it's not growing, then you can essentially just leave it alone. And uh, fibroadenomas are uh, essentially perpetuated by hormonal changes. And you're going to see it in younger patients. So I've had patients, teenagers, with actually pretty large fibroadenomas, which I had to remove and operate on because they were growing and they were four or five centimeters. Um, but as you get older and your hormone levels uh, go down, you stop having periods, those fibroadenomas, it, it would be quite rare to see. Now, if you have a fibroadenoma that's growing, or I had some patients that are four or five centimeters, there is a potential that there could be uh, uh, a cancer being uh, essentially hidden within that mass that you're missing. So in those instances, uh, one of the reasons we want to uh, remove them, not only because they're so large, is because their potential that something is being harbored inside. And our next question is about any possible fear of, you know, opening bodies, seeing organs, touching blood. Was that applicable for you? And if so, how did you overcome that? For me, no. So when I was doing, I remember at Hoke Hospital, I was volunteering on the wards and I had never been in the operating room before. And I was wondering, oh, how am I going to act? And it was great. Like I loved being in there. And I remember when I was a medical student, I think one of my attendings said, when you're in the operating room, make sure you touch the organs, you feel them, see the, the texture of it. Of course, you ask for permission first, because you may not never get that opportunity again. And I, I was excited because it's what you read in the book and what you see in the textbook, but then what you actually see and feel in the operating room is something completely different and it really um, enhances your experience. So uh, for me, I mean, I just loved being in the operating room. So I knew that surgery was the right path for me. Now, if you're terrified of blood, you think it's disgusting, you don't want to be around the intestines or anything else, then maybe rethink surgery. Yeah, 
it is the truth um, that they have some motor and, and general like physical um, barriers sometimes to, to some specialties, surgery obviously being one of them. Yeah. Our next question is, were there any parts of the general surgery residency rotations that you just didn't like at all? Were there any particular, I guess, subspecialties, right, that, that you just didn't have, didn't want anything to do with, but I know that you obviously were, were attracted to breast surgical oncology. Um, right. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, in, in general surgery residency, you have to go through all these other rotations, whether you like it or not. And I mean, for the, I mean, most part, I'm just, you know, hanging in there doing okay. But I knew that, you know, I'm not going to go into vascular surgery. I'm not interested in this. I'm not going to go into transplant. It's just not for me. However, those rotations are still important because you're developing your surgical skill set. You're building that foundation of how to operate. So even though I do exclusively breast surgery, techniques that I learned in training, I still use it in the operating room. For example, when I'm doing a, a breast surgery and let's say I hit a blood vessel and now there's a lot of bleeding and it's just squirting in the air, don't panic. But I know exactly what I need, need to do to handle that because I learned how to do that through my training. So um, I, you know, I, I will say, you know, some of the rotations like vascular uh, transplant, you know, very intense, very long days, you know, not, not that enjoyable at the time, but looking back retrospectively, it's like, eh, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, it is all worth it in the end. You just have to get to that certain point. Yes. And then we're going to maybe wrap it up with a few last questions. The next one, being, sure. what was the impetus or the interest or the motivation, I guess, behind subspecializing. Um, did you ever consider just sticking to general surgery? For me, um, when I was a medical student, uh, my first rotation was surgery. And uh, one of the, I, I did orthopedics, it's just whatever they assigned. It was orthopedics, uh, vascular, then I had surgical oncology, and I worked with a couple of the breast surgeons. And I loved working with them. I thought, first off, they were great people. I thought they were great surgeons. I thought they were great with the patients. I enjoyed being in clinic and learning from them. And they let me examine the patients. I loved being in the operating with, with them. Um, I even had the opportunity as a medical student to operate. I mean, I was assisting and working with my attendings because the funny thing is, um, oftentimes uh, residents in, in surgery, they're not interested in breast surgery. So they try to kind of avoid that rotation. So it was just me as a medical student and my attending. So I got to do so much more and it was so exciting. And I was so happy to do anything. I mean, suturing. I mean, I was assisting with mastectomies. I had the best time. And it also helped me know what I was getting myself into. And I was like, I love this. I also enjoyed my research product projects. And I was just so passionate. And I really loved the continuity of care I had with the patients. You know, when you think about it in general surgery, a lot of times, for example, someone comes in, um, their gallbladder is inflamed, you remove their gallbladder, you see them after surgery, and that's it. Some people, that's fine. I do like that I develop a relationship with my patients. Um, for example, today I had a couple of patients who I operated on for cancer um, just over a year ago. And it's great to see them after they've completed all their treatment. They're doing so well in life. They're so happy. Um, everything's healed up very nicely. They have great cosmesis. And it's just nice to see them come full circle. That is a great point. That is a great point. I, I didn't even notice that nuance, right? Between general surgery and a subspecialty like breast surgical oncology, that, that is definitely a great point. Last question being um, about residency. So when you were in the application season for residency, did you notice anything particular to breast surgical oncology that was really emphasized by program directors that they really sought out in applic applicants? 
So when applying to a fellowship, a couple of things were important. Um, you really want to try and do uh, research in breast, which I did as a resident as well. And I ended up presenting that and publishing it. So that makes you stand out. It shows that you're dedicated. It shows that you're proactive. You also want to seek mentorship from a breast surgeon where you can get advice from. They can write letter of recommendation. You may not have the opportunity to work with a breast surgeon in your program, but at least from a surgical oncologist or even a general surgeon who does uh, breast surgery. Um, those are going to be the biggest things. And I mean, when you're applying, you your um, CV and everything that you talk about in the interview should essentially demonstrate this story of why you want to go into that particular specialty. And you should paint, be able to paint a picture that you're very enthusiastic, you're very uh, proactive, and it should be demonstrated on your application. And that also may be um, extracurricular activities or presenting your research, like I said, uh, just showing uh, your involvement. I think a lot of that transfers over to really a lot of the stages for application for yes. there's fellowship, residency, medical school. And speaking of which, our last question is, um, with the application cycle around the corner, it's always every summer for medical school. Mm -hmm, I I'm sure remember. there's a lot of students who would leverage um, any advice that you have for whether it be personal statements, interviews, anything that you think is overlooked or not mentioned enough, not emphasized enough within the whole application process. So, gosh, there's so there's many things, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, try oh, so I'm trying to think back. So one, don't lie. Um, for interviews, practice beforehand. Literally talk in front of a mirror if you don't have someone, but come with some prepared answers because they're going to ask you, tell me about yourself. And that's your opportunity to give a little blurb about yourself and why you're interested in whatever medical school or residency you're applying to. Show that you're interested um, be able to uh, communicate uh, well and, and try to be eloquent. Uh, personal statements, try to make something uh, stand out, uh, put thought into it, um, show your interest for whatever you're applying to if you can in your personal statement. And I would say try to write something specific, give an example, don't do something vague or broad. You want uh, something uh, to stand out. And I would say also um, just whatever you're applying for, be persistent. Um, and you know, if things maybe don't work out, you have to um, self-reflect, self-evaluate. Okay, I did not score well on this exam or I did not get interviews to these programs. Why didn't I? I need to figure out what are my weaknesses? How can I improve them? Set goals for yourself and set timelines. It can be very overwhelming with all the applications and very stressful and very competitive, but just regroup again, setting goals for yourself, checking in for yourself. And if you feel like you're struggling, seek mentorship either from um, the, the counselors in your program or fellow um, residents or medical students, um, you know, ask, ask for help, ask questions, show that you're interested. And, you know, it, uh, it's a long process. So just, you know, just be prepared, be diligent, and you can, you know, get through it. I think that's some great advice to end off on. I do have some last reminders for students listening in. So to our shadowers, if you're interested in earning credit for your attendance today, we have a quiz posted in the chat box and also on our virtual shadowing page. The quiz will be due at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time this upcoming Sunday, March 26th. And with that quiz, if you do pass it, six out of 10 questions or more to pass, you'll receive a certificate afterwards. Uh, that certificate will be sent to the email inbox that you list on the quiz. Let us know if you don't happen to find it in your spam folder. Although if you don't happen to find it in your inbox, please do check your spam folder ahead of time. Um, like I said, though, feel free to email us if you don't find it in either. And then our next session will be tomorrow. Like I said, we'll have an extra session tomorrow with Dr. Azen. He's a cosmetic and implant dentist. So for our pre-dental students, we wanted to deliver 
We'll see him tomorrow at the same time, 7 p.m. Central as usual. I do also want to say a big thank you to Dr. Bonev for getting this um, presentation together for her advice. Um, there were a lot of great questions and uh, we're, we'd love to hear your answers. Thank you again for getting this together. It's really great to see a subspecialty, like I said. Um, thank but yeah, you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. That's gonna wrap it up though for tonight. Uh, like I said at the beginning, if you, you if you didn't catch it, if you wanna hear more about our sessions, either follow us on Instagram or join our listserv. Those are great ways to stay in touch with us. We do have a few more programs outside of virtual shadowing, but virtual shadowing is our ongoing program. It goes on almost through any part of the year. At the moment, our other programs for volunteering and mentorship, they, um, they're closed at the moment uh, because their application cycles open up at the start of each semester. So the next one will actually be later this fall, um, but you will still get those updates once they roll around. Um, although with that said, I hope everyone enjoys a great rest of your evening. Thank you again, Dr. Bonev, for getting this all together. Um, and we will see all of you tomorrow. Take care.